So we're in the middle of an intellectual revolution. And the revolution encompasses neuroscience, sociology, psychology, genetics, behavioral economics, and a var variety of other fields. And what all these different fields are doing is they're shining flashlights into the box that we call non-cognitive skills, into the box of the mind, which is we can't count by IQ scores, but which are all tremendously important to success. And when we, they shine into this box, they've learned certain things about what really shapes the way people think. One of the things they've learned is that much of the action that takes place in the human mind, most of the action, happens below the level of awareness. Timothy Wilson, a guy at the University of Virginia, points out there are 12 million, the, the mind is capable of absorbing 12 million pieces of information uh, per minute. It is able to consciously think about 40 of those. So all the rest is entering the mind, being processed, but not consciously aware. Jonathan Haidt, who's also at the University of Virginia, compares it to a boy riding the elephant. The boy is the conscious part of the mind, it steers the elephant, but most of the muscle power, most of the drive power is the elephant itself, the unconscious part of the mind. And what behavioral economists uh, and neuroscientists and sociologists and psychologists are now doing is trying to understand this unconscious process, which is very different than the Freudian unconscious and a much more scientifically tested one. So this unconscious process, these things that drive us, have many different streams. The one and the one we all fantasize about is the power of genes. And if you read the media these days, there's a God gene, a gay gene, a humor gene, a violence gene. And there has been an, an enthusiasm about the power of genetics. And genetics is important. And there are certain twins experiments or twins stories that people tell to illustrate the power of genetics. My favorite one involves the two gyms. These are two men who are twins separated at birth. And there seem to be an amazing number of these kids because there are thousands <laughs> of studies on this. But the two gyms were separated at birth. They met for the first time when they were 39 years old. When they met, they discovered, uh, not surprisingly, that they both had high blood pressure, they both suffered from migraines, they both had a lazy eye, they both suffered from hemorrhoids. <laughs> they also discovered they both chain smoked Salem cigarettes, they both bit their nails, they both had carpentry workshops in their basements, they both had built a bench around the tree in their front yard. They both went to the same Florida beach vacation. They both had a dog named Toy. They both had a wife named Betty. They both had divorced Betty and married a woman named Linda. <laughs> One of them had named his son James Allen. The other had named his son James Allen with a different spelling. This is an amazing series of coincidences. Uh, it's also completely non-indicative of the power of genes. Genes are important, but believe me, there's no gene for marrying Betty. And, but, so, but this is an important driver of, of the way we think we are driven, in certain sense, by some of the influences of genes and the way genes interact in the environment. But what's happening now in genetic science is if you read the literature, the scientists are pulling way back. They're now coming to understand that there, there's no one-to-one -one relationship between a gene and a behavior. There are thousands of relationships, and it's all the gene is trained to interact with the environment. So asking which is more important, nature or nurture, is like asking which is more important for a home run, a bat, or a baseball. They're both necessary. But, but genes are still important. Culture is another thing. The categories we have in our minds that we don't even think about shape the way we decide and perceive the world. A little story of this involved a study I saw recently about parking tickets in New York among diplomats. As you know, diplomats can park free and sort of write off their tickets. Uh, Transparency International does a, a survey of which are the most corrupt cultures in the world. And it turns out the diplomats from the most corrupt cultures had the most number of parking tickets. The, the country with the least number of parking tickets were countries like Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Israel. They had zero per diplomat. Kuwait, 236 per diplomat. If you're a Swede, it doesn't matter if you can park next to the fire hydrant. You're not going to do it because you're a Swede. Uh, and so that's another thing that shapes the way uh, we perceive the world. Then there's brain sculpture and just the way the mind works, develops heuristics and the way it responds. My pa favorite little example of this is that people named Dennis are disproportionately likely to become dentists. People <laughs> named Lauren are disproportionately likely to become lawyers. People named Georgia are disproportionately likely to live in Georgia. 
which is why I've named my children President of the United States Brooks. Um, and so the, the mind seeks out familiarity. And so some of the most important choices we make in life are in some small measure determined by how that occupation sounds to us. And so that's an example of brain sculpture. And then there are a whole series of other things that we are not aware of that shape our, our discriminations. There's a Princeton uh, experiment, a researcher named Todorov who gives people pictures of politicians, uh, just the faces, gives them less, less of a second to look at the faces and then says, which one of these candidates do you think won the election that they were running against each other for? And people pick with 70% accuracy who won the election, just with less than a second of looking at the faces. Uh, and then finally, so that's all these different processes that we're not aware of. Then there's the power of emotion. The other, the second big avenue they're discovering in this intellectual revolution is the idea that Dr. Spock is smart and that emotional people are not smart is wrong. That emotion is the essential core of thinking. Antonio Damasio, who's at the University of Southern California, is one of the leading researchers on this. He had a, he had a patient named Elliot. And Elliot was a very successful person who suffered from a stroke. After he suffered from the stroke, which destroyed a certain part of his brain, he no longer could do his job because he couldn't organize his day. He lost all his money, he was divorced, he married an inappropriate person, he blew his life savings on a terrible decision. Elliot came in to see Damasio, and Damasio began talking to him, to wondering what was wrong with him, why was his life going so far downhill. He noticed Elliot felt no grief or no sadness about his life and what had happened to it. Then he showed Elliot pictures of mutilated children, of hurricanes, of horrible things. Elliot had no emotional reaction to those things. He said, I know I should be responding to those things, but I, have, I just don't have the ability to that, do that. And so what Damasio realized was Elliot's emotional landscape was flat. He was not able to make emotional judgments or perceive emotional differences between different things. And if you can't do that, you won't remember anything because emotion is what tells your brain to remember stuff. You also can't make decisions because emotion is what just gives value to different things, the emotional sort of emotional positioning system. And so emotion is the central organizing process of the brain. And that translates into school. We learn from people we love. Uh, and the power of emotion in shaping who we learn from, who we want to succeed in front of. It shapes the way we think, the way we make decisions. This is the second uh, big stream. The third, I think, big stream of research uh, in, that's being uncovered by this, uh, this revolution is the permeability of the human mind. You take a baby, it's 40 minutes old, you put your face in front of it and wag a tongue in front of the baby, the baby will wag his or her tongue back at you. Now, the baby doesn't know anything about a human, doesn't know what blob it's seeing in front of it, but somehow it knows this blob has a tongue, I have a tongue, it mirrors. And they have these things called mirror neurons, which help us copy. And the permeability of the human mind to pick up waves, to pick up ideas from the people around us subconsciously, whether it's a yawn or a laugh or a meme, as they say, is just tremendously empowering. And what it, I think what this little avenue has done is broken down, frankly, the John Wayne image of American individualism, that we are all rashly making decisions, we're out there on the range all alone, and we're making decisions on alone, all alone. That just doesn't happen.